Hello everybody, this is Raj. I'm Ashwin. And I'm Eri. And this is Blood Cancer Talks. As you guys know, Blood Cancer Talks is a podcast that is exclusively dedicated to hematologic malignancies, where we bring in content experts who live and breathe a particular disease or a treatment area, and we focus on the latest uh, biology and clinical advances. So today we have the privilege of having Dr. Ajay Chari, who is a myeloma faculty at Mount Sinai and soon to move to UCSF as the director of the myeloma program there. And uh, Dr. Chari is an expert on all things multiple myeloma, but specifically in bispecific antibodies and has led some of the seminal clinical trials that led to approval of some of these bispecific antibodies. Dr. Chari, we are really happy to have you today. For the audience, can you tell us a little bit about what your clinical and research focus is? Sure, thank you so much for having me. Um, I've been doing myeloma for about two decades almost now. So as you alluded to, it's interesting to be going back to where I started my journey as a hemog fellow where I was pluripotent and Tom Martin actually got me inspired to go into myeloma. And now it's uh, such an honor to go back in a different capacity. Uh, but basically I've been involved with novel therapeutics, primarily phase one and two studies, uh, but I'm a myeloma nerd and I like it all. We will jump right in. So um, we will divide this episode into three or four broad sections. So we'll first talk about, in general, about bispecific antibodies, specifically in BCMA bispecific antibody. Then after that, we'll focus on GPRC5D bispecific antibody. Then we will talk a little bit about the currently running clinical trials and the future directions. And then if time permits, we'll talk about some practical clinical questions that we are facing in the clinic with the, some of these antibodies now available and FDA approved. So Dr. Chari, for our audience, can you give us a 10,000 foot view on the structure and mechanism of action of bispecific antibodies using maybe BCMA as an example? Yeah, sure. I always like to mention, start with that every monoclonal antibody used in human beings actually owes its legacy to myeloma, right? Because Nobel Prize in the 80s fused a myeloma cell to a spleen cell. And the first naked antibody didn't come till much later in 2015. And now we're on this new uh, designer, next generation types of antibodies. And so the bispecifics, um, and we should broaden it, there's even now tri-specifics, a lot of different approaches. But the idea is that now that the engineering has gotten better, you don't need to have both binding targets be the same antigen. And so with most of these bispecifics, they're typically targeting a tumor antigen and a T cell antigen, but there's also now NK cell antigens, and also some are targeting two different epitopes, either on the immune cell or the cancer cell. So for myeloma, the three most prominent targets, I would say, are uh, BCMA, GPRC5B, FCRH5. Of course, we're all familiar with CD38, and there are some CD38 bispecifics, but those are the four primary targets of bispecifics. And I think one of your other questions was, how do they work? And, you know, I always joke that it's, depending on what you're into, it's either double-sided tape or, or handcuffs. So uh, you're basically trafficking T cells to, in, in the case of the most advanced bispecifics, to the myeloma target um, using the, one of those three primary antigens. And when those T cells are trafficked to the tumor, they release their cytokines and cause perforin, granzymes, and these poke holes in this target membrane and you have apoptosis. So it's basically you know, targeting your snipers uh, to where you want them to go. Sounds good. So as you know, the first bispecific that was approved for ALL as blenatumumab was a continuous infusion. Similarly, the AMG420 that was initially developed for myeloma was also a, a continuous infusion. Um, so why are some of these are continuous infusion versus the ones that are being developed now? They are, you know, less frequent, just one time dosing. Yeah, I think the, the pros of continuous infusion is you can turn it off and then if there's toxicity, you're done with it. The cons are you have to have a continuous IV drip because of the short half-life of these small molecules. And we know that myeloma patients already struggle with recurrent infections. So to be mandating continuous IV therapy, which would then require ports or central lines, I think is, is not without its own risk. And obviously the convenience, um, extravasation issues. So for all those practical reasons, I think we've moved away from the short half-life. So AMG 420 was discontinued and there's a longer half-life equivalent. And I would say the majority of the bispecifics in clinical trials are really closer to a full structure antibody with the exception that there's a so-called a harpoon compound, which is a still short half-life, but it has an albumin extender to improve the half-life of the drug. But most of the bispecifics in clinical trials right now are have a full FC portion. However, the FC portion is silent because you wouldn't necessarily want these um, immune effector activation being targeted towards your T cells or NK cells. So you want to try to have the harnessing of the tumor antigen and the T cell or NK cell, but without destruction off target. So 
most of these are full struct, full thickness antibodies with a uh, silent uh, FC portion. All right, so basically the FC portion enables it to be a long acting, right? Because it's, an, it's a full structure antibody, right. but at the same time, it's silent so that we don't want like the CDC or the ADCC, like all those mechanisms coming into play. It makes sense. Correct. Um, as in, as you know, in non-Hodgkin lymphoma also, there are many bispecific antibodies in development. And one of them in a glufitumab has a two is to one CD20 is to CD3 binding ratio. In myeloma, are all of the ones that are currently in development, are all of them one to one ratio or is one of them, you know, like, or, or do they have structures like that, that two is to one or three is to one ratio in some of them as well? Yeah, so most of the, the let's start with the bispecifics. Almost all the bispecifics are one to one with the exception of two. There's a BCMA uh, bispecific alnuctumab, which is a two to one BCMA. And there's also uh, a GPRC targeting antibody called formidamig from Roche which also is a two to one for GPRC. What that means clinically, I think we still don't know, keeping in mind that almost all the studies to date are small single arm phase one studies. And therefore the differences in patient populations will make it very difficult to have granular comparisons of whether one to one and two to one makes a difference. I would say preliminarily, we don't see any major differences in safety, which could be concern, but we haven't seen that. But the one other construct or compound that has also entered a clinical trial is actually a CC923298, which is a tri-specific BCMA, CD16, and an NKG2D. So uh, there are three different antigens. It's not a two to one, they're just three different antigens, two on the NK, one on the myeloma. All right, and what's the typical half-life of these half-life ex extended by specific antibodies, which are most of them currently? Usually they're coming up to be around four, uh, four days. So most of the initial dosing is about weekly, but yeah. there's a lot of interest, as you know, in more infrequent dosing, whether it's bi-weekly, monthly. And I would say most of them, uh, a, a sizable number are intravenous, but then another sizable proportion are also sub-Q, which obviously also changes the pharmacokinetics of the construct. Okay. All right, so now uh, let's jump into BCMA by specific antibodies, which you know we have so many right now. Uh, just for the audience, so the one that is teclistamab by Janssen, that's the one that's F FD approved. Then we have elrantamab from Pfizer. We have linvoseltamab from Regeneron. We have alnuctamab, which is two is to one, the one that you alluded to from BMS. And then we have an AbbVie product, the ABVV383. I don't think it has a name yet, at least I'm not aware. So, um, you know, with all these compounds, can you comment on what is the ballpark overall response rate and CR rate at the MTD of these bispecific antibodies? And does any one of the products stand out to you regarding, you know, higher or lower efficacy? Yeah, the, to put the responses into context, historically, to get an accelerated approval in myeloma, you needed a 20, 30% response rate in a PFS for three to four months. And now we're seeing these incredible responses in even more heavily treated patients of probably 60 to 70% across all the BCMA bispecifics. And it's the fact that we're even talking about efficacy from phase one studies is in itself striking, right? Because the, the sample sizes of these studies range from anywhere from 60 to 250 or so. And but yeah, here we are talking about efficacy from phase one dose escalation study, and it just shows the kind of almost logarithmic improvement in outcomes that we've seen with these T cell redirection therapies. So I don't, I think because they are also smaller single arm with a variety of doses studied, there's going to be inherent differences in patient populations and disease characteristics. So I think it's hard to say that there's any one construct. It is be becoming almost like these are the statins of myeloma and do we really need so many? But I think ultimately... It's good for the market, right? It's good to have competition to, you know, to get more products to patients globally. I mean, I think we have to keep that in mind that not all products are being delivered to all patients around the world and uh, hopefully in a most cost-effective fashion as well. So it's nice to have for a change, a lot of uh, competition to hopefully give the best product to the patient. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, just the ballpark, you know, overall response rate and CR rate, like how much you are typically seeing across these products, understanding that it's hard to make head-to-head -head comparison, but the ballpark numbers. Yeah, I would say the, the response rates are in that 60 to 70%, and the CR rates tend to be anywhere from like 20 to 30%. Uh, but I think some of the, there's also differences in follow-up time so far, but the, but what, what to that point though, the responses are also quite rapid and early. So Median time to response is probably within a month, and the median time to best response is probably around three months. I and mean, I'm sure one of the questions is really the duration of these doses, but, but those, those characteristics of high response rate, rapid and deep, give us hope that we can modify things in the future, and I think there's a lot of excitement about that.
Yeah, in terms of the responses with with CAR T, sometimes we see a deepening of response over time. Is that something that we also see with the bispecifics? I think so, a lot of that is has to do with the paraprotein half life. So in my experience, like when you have light chain only patients, I see profound reductions in light chains even during priming. And the reason that I'm sometimes checking more often is because something that is really not reported in the literature and in presentations is this concept of tumor flare, which we always talk about historically, but have never seen. And I think it, maybe our solid tumor colleagues who treat with like checkpoint inhibitors are talking about those things. But in myeloma, I think we are seeing that. We are seeing patients who have worsening pain during the initial doses, and it's yet correlated with serological improvement. And so what's happening, I think, is you're having... T cell trafficking to sites of disease. So to answer your question, I think the half life, um, the the patients with light chain myeloma, we're seeing responses quite rapid. The heavy chain myeloma, what's interesting, especially when you're targeting BCMA, you're getting profound hypogammaglobulinemia, and what that does is there's an FC neonatal receptor which is responsible for recycling immunoglobulins. So if you have a patient with a heavy chain myeloma, especially the IgG, which is the most common. The time to response may be delayed because there's this recirculation of a small amount of protein. So it may take a long time for that VGPR to translate into a stringent CR. And I think that's what we're seeing with CAR T's as well. You have a profound cytoreduction. Your bone marrow is MRD negative almost the first time you check, but the paraproteins don't disappear for anywhere from one to three months later if it's a heavy chain myeloma. Yeah, absolutely. We have definitely seen that. And, and the pain that definitely in the clinical trials I have seen in some of the patients who had significant pain, even like while the light chains were going down. Uh, what is the median duration of response and PFS that you expect to see with these, you know, single agent bispecific antibody in a triple class refractory or penta refractory setting? Well, what's really striking is the, the delta there, because historically, when you look at CAR, POM, DARA, CELI, the delta between PFS and DOR is not that different, you know, um, but here what's striking is that teclistamab, which is the most mature data, I think the median pop is 14 months. The PFS was around 11 months and the DOR was 18 months, which is really for patients who are pentadrug refractory or triple class refractory to be talking about numbers like that with a monotherapy is really mind blowing, right? And I think it's super exciting and we're, I think we're all eager to see how these constructs do uh, as they move up earlier and in combinations. But yeah, those are really impressive PFS and DR that we've seen. And I think the other ones are going to get there. It's just that their follow-up is shorter. Yeah. So now let's switch gears to toxicity, you know, as these are our phase one studies. So we have to talk about toxicity. So what is the ballpark numbers for CRS and ICANS, all great CRS and all great ICANS that typically quote patients when you're starting these drugs? So I think the CRS is probably, depending on the construct, ranging from four, anywhere from 20, 30% to as high as 70%. I would say most are in that 50, 60%. And some of the differences may, you know, there's this one construct that's slightly different. We didn't talk about within BCNA how the constructs differ, but they do differ in terms of whether some are humanized, some are fully human. The one in particular that's kind of uh, unique is the ABV compound, which is a low CD3 affinity. It's fully human. And so for that reason, their initial efforts did not include step up or priming doses. And so uh, it's in, it'll be interesting to see how that data set matures. But uh, with the exception of that compound, I think they've all had step up dosing to try to mitigate CRS. But most of the CRS, unlike CAR T, is really, really low grade. I would say grade three and four is across the board, very uncommon at most, probably two, three uh, percent, but it's quite uncommon. Um, I think the other infections with BCMA, probably the number one is infections. And it's actually quite concerning, I would say. I think uh, the community as a whole is very concerned about these infections. Because again, historically, when you have a single arm study in a heavily treated patient population, it's really hard to take out the patient component from the disease component from the treatment component. And But what we have now are contemporaneous enrollments to other targets. And I do think there are differences, which I know we're going to be talking about. But looping back to the BCMA target, probably the one with the, the longest follow-up to date, which is teclistamab, their rates of all grade infections was 76% and grade three and higher is 46%. And then the neutropenia signal was 71% all grade, 64% grade three and higher. I would say the thrombocytopenia grade three and higher is pretty low. It's like 21% and we don't see a lot of bleeding. But I think that infection is really important 
And the other thing I would just encourage all listeners and readers of these articles to pay attention to is deaths, because on the one hand, we're saying these are very active agents with rapid, deep, durable responses. But on the other hand, you're seeing a fair number of deaths and a lot of those are due to infections. And I think there's been talk in the community that we should stop. I always say, I don't care what the investigator thinks about the attribution. Let me decide as a reader. Tell me the patient's status, their age, their myeloma status, whether, you know, what their immunoglobulin level was, what was the immediate cause of death. And then we should all decide as our own interpreters of the data. And I think regulatory agencies should be mandating that because the days of letting investigators or sponsors determine, I think, are behind us because these deaths are important. And I would just add to that one particular concern is COVID-related deaths, right? So with teclistamab, the rates of COVID-related deaths have been going up, the rates of all grade infections have been going up, and the rates of grade three, three and higher infections have been going up. So what's concerning is we're not seeing a plateau. It's not that, okay, you know what, um, it's those first three months where you need to get myeloma disease control, that's when the deaths happen. That's very different. In, in contrast, we're seeing this relentless like slope up of all of those infections, COVID, grade three, four, all grade infections, which is why I think there's a lot of questions about what's the right way to mitigate those infectious complications. I couldn't agree more with you in terms of the attribution. I think that's a, a really important point. Um, what sort of infections are we seeing and have you seen in your patients with receiving bispecifics and what sort of profile of infections and what are the kind of implications of that? So we actually just submitted a manuscript look, looking at our experience with about 40 patients who were treated with BCMA. And I'll just give you two anecdotes of my own patients who I think just, you know, should put the fear in everybody is one was uh, both of the patients were in very good remissions. I think probably CRs or stringent CRs. One went to the ER with fatigue and was found to have a pericardial effusion that caused a tamponade that required emergent drainage. And the organism was a Neisseria subspecies, which I'd never heard of. Then the other patient went to the hospital with a pneumonia, but found to have an empyema requiring a chest tube drainage. So these are kinds of infections that we've not seen before that, yes, we, myeloma is known to be immunopoietic, and yes, we know it causes bacterial infections, but these kinds of bacterial infections requiring pericardial drain, chest tube are really crazy. And I think that's not just our experience. So I would say the bulk, a significant portion of these are bacterial. Then there's also in the teclistamab paper with, again, I, I don't think we should pick on teclistamab because it just has the longest follow-up, but they all the BCMA bispecifics have the same profile in my view. And there is about a 10% incidence of PJP or PCP. I don't know what you kids call it. I feel like every time I listen, there's a new acronym, but whatever that P something put in the middle letter P it, it's so we've we've been prophylaxing and then the other thing we've been doing at Mount Sinai two other things that we do is we've been monitoring CMV PCRs because we have seen a lot of so obviously we talked about bacterial we talked about PJP but also viral infections are very common with these agents and that explains the COVID related deaths in fact at our site when we looked at COVID antibody production Basically, with a BCMA bispecific, you have zero antibody production unless you give multiple, multiple booster shots. And in contrast, CAR T's, even though in the first six months, because they've gotten fludarabine cyclophosphamide and they're also targeting BCMA, you do see some impact. But because it's more of a one and done, uh, you do see some antibody production for COVID vaccines with CAR T. So I think what's unique about BCMA targeting bispecifics, it's this relentless targeting of that antigen which then compromises the patient's ability to mount antibody responses. So I would say bacterial, viral, fungal. Fungal, we haven't seen as much. It was like, uh, so in our data set that we looked at, they were mainly like candida that was fluconazole sensitive and they were like skin infections, topical. So not overwhelming, life-threatening infections. But because of this, the viral thing, we did start checking CMV in our data set. We started doing CMV PCRs monthly and the incidence of CMV reactivation was almost 25%. Most of those were not clinical and not treated. There were two who had, one had pneumonitis and one had esophagitis who did require therapy. And of course, the challenge with treating CMV is that the, the drugs, the very drugs that we use are also going to cause significant myelosuppression in the background of already high rates of neutropenia in an immunocompromised population. So I don't, you know, I, I, when I present this data, I, I do think for CMV in particular, it's really important to work with infectious disease specialists to really figure out who needs treatment, when, with which agent. But those are kind of, that's like a high level overview. And the only other thing I would add, um, and which we presented at ASH last year is 
it, what can you do to prevent it, right? And I think the biggest thing we found is IVIG. I think what we found is that first is when you talk about hypogamma, which in the published data sets to date, it's reported as 75%. But I think the reporting is terrible in myeloma because it's, it's not an AE that we have historically reported, right? Because everybody has hypogamma and we've never really can't, talked about it. So the language that we're using is not good. Secondly, the numbers are not good because you may not have quantitatively low IgG, but if you're an IgG myeloma, most of that IgG is not functional, right? So what we did in our data set was to subtract out the monoclonal component. And the way we did that is, let's say you have an M spike of 1.5, you multiply that by 1,000 and 1,500 of your IgG should be taken away. So if you have an IgG of 2,000 and your M spike's 1.5, you have hypogamma. You probably have at most 500 IgG. So when we did this analysis, there's a, a very high prevalence of baseline hypogamma. And then the, the incidence of severe hypogamma, which I think some we've discussed is less than 400, is essentially 100% in responding patients. So if you're going to give a BCMA bispecific to a myeloma patient, you are guaranteeing profound hypogamma. And you can either wait for crazy infections like the one I told you about, or just get the IVIG going. And I think Finally, some of the sponsors are also catching on because um, between the IVIG shortage and the cost, and given the global nature of these studies, sponsors are probably going to have to provide IVIG uh, reimbursement in some settings. So we've decided to start IVIG pretty much as soon as you're out of the CRS range, because then you can rarely have infusion-related reactions. And just one final word on IVIG is also, uh, I think because maybe we've seen it more because we're using it a lot, but... There are rare nephrotoxicities associated even with this hypoosmolar formulation. We've had some patients with increased creatinine and also increasing proteinuria. And what we did in speaking to our pharmacists and nephrologists is to run it slower and give isotonic solutions to replace it and also not give it as frequently if they have CKD. Um, but just those are some of the strategies we've done. Thanks. That's a great summary. To sort of summarize, I think you said IVIG for pretty much everyone, PJP prophylaxis for pretty much everyone, monthly CMVs with about 25% uh, reactivation, and obviously CMV if someone had a symptom of, of that could be active CMV, uh, and watching out for atypical bacterial infections, but no kind of change to fungal infections, and of course, close collaboration with infectious diseases physicians across the board. Did I kind of get that about right? Oh, perfect. And one other thing I would add is uh, the COVID issue, right? Which is get your patients vaccinated and boosted before starting. And if they get, you know, have a low threshold for detection of, you know, testing for COVID, hold, hold the drugs. If, because again, the responses are quite rapid, deep, and durable. And we did this experiment in New York, right? In 2020, we had to hold a lot of patients who are on active by specifics. And very few of them had disease relapses. So if you have an active infection, whether it's bacterial, viral, fungal, you usually have plenty of time to let the patient recover uh, because of nature, the mechanism of action is not something like a conventional therapy where you stop the drug and the disease blows up again. So I think from a risk benefit point of view, hold the drug. And then for COVID, based on emerging resistance pattern, use the appropriate therapeutics, whether it's oral, parenteral, I think those things will keep changing over time. But these are very, very immunocompromised patients. And, and you've seen that because um, in contrast to, for example, the BCMA targeted by specifics, you see very little COVID deaths with talquetamab, even though it's enrolled in the same time period. And we've shown in the laboratory that you don't see have the same COVID antibody blockade with talquetamab that you, you see with the BCMA directed therapy. So I think for BCMA by specifics, it's in addition to everything um, Eddie just mentioned, I would also include the COVID monitoring, they're intervening early. And the good news also is IVIG finally actually has some COVID antibodies now. In fact, most of our, it was interesting because if you look at COVID antibodies before community vaccination, very few IVIG products had protected any kind of COVID antibody, but now pretty much, um, I think depending on your own individual sites assays, most uh, patients getting IVIG have some low level of COVID antibodies detected, even in BCMA by specific patients, which I think is not coming from the vaccine, because that's what some people think. It's just coming from passive transfer through the IVIG product. Yeah, that's a, a great point regarding the IVIG. 
How do you think these sort of infection risks might influence kind of the duration of treatment, the frequency of treatment, the dosing of treatment? Obviously, early phase clinical trials have endpoints that are geared on response, which don't, you know, if you get an infection or any other AE, um, but have a response, you're still a responder. How do you think for kind of IITs and cooperative group trials and, and other industry trials going forward that the infections might influence these sorts of things? Yeah, I think it goes back to the point of phase one studies, obviously, is to look at safety and efficacy, but you don't really get to put the, those things into context of how do you control for the patient and disease variables that are contributing. But I think, as I alluded to, you have the historical contemporaneous controls of other targets. But I think getting to your specific question, this was essentially what there was that FDA myeloma meeting earlier this year where the crux was, we have this great accelerated approval strategy, which I think is really important because literally patients who are looking at hospice, a delay of six months to a year could result in the death of that patient. So we need to try to keep the accelerated approval process going, but not compromise <clears throat> learning and big picture and ultimate dosing. And so I bring that up in answer to your question, because historically accelerated approval, what's it based on? Response rate. So you historically, there was this push to optimize the response rate and then let the pieces fall where they may when, when it comes to toxicity. And I think we need to move past that and look at what you kind of alluded to, which is dose intensity. You can play with all of those variables. And I would say, let me, at the outset, there are two groups of patients that I would not play around with too much, which is who, if in the era of T-cell redirection therapies, what are the unmet needs? I would say in the current studies, it looks like ISS3 and extramedullary disease. Those patients are gonna declare themselves. So their PFS is not going to be 11 to 18 months. It's going to be much shorter. And so there, I think we need more information before we would probably kind of back off too much. But on the other extreme, if you're going to have a median PFS of 11 months and a DR of 18 months, it's, that delta suggests that, you know, those patients who respond probably stay responding. And I think the first clue to the duration of therapy question is sevastamab, which is the only, there's actually two bispecifics that did, did not do treatment to progression. One is sevastamab, and the other one is formitamig, the other GPRC coming from Roche that's primarily being accruing in Europe. Those two studies did fixed duration therapy for a year. Formitamig has not released that data, but sevastamab did release data at ASH 2022, and out of 18 patients, uh, 14 remained in remission with about a year, a little bit less than a year follow-up, which means that if you give 12 months of therapy and stop therapy, the vast majority of those patients remain in remission with sevastamab, right? And also it tended to be more the responding patients. So like the PR, CR, stringent CRs, I think there we really should ask what is the risk benefit? Because the question about duration of treatment has to have both parts of the equation. What do you get from treating to progression and what do you lose, right? And I think for these deep remission patients, we probably should be looking at, looking at all variables, including duration, and maybe for those deep remission patients where you're, even though um, we're not sure what you're going to get, but we do seem to see from teclistimab this continued treatment with a relentless increase in infections. So I think that trade-off is much more tricky. So maybe right now, one year seems to be a potential way of looking at it in IITs and other studies, but I would restrict it to BCMA. I just want to make sure that people don't, I don't think we need to make a blanket statement across all targets because it really depends on for a given target, what's happening with continued therapy to progression versus fixed duration, right? And that's a different question, and it depends on the patient factors, the ISS extra. And then I would say the third kind of subgroup, which is not initially coming from these phase one studies, but now more emergent, is in prior T cell redirection therapies. I think there's, we shouldn't be too eager to stop and decrease intensity of therapy because these patients are truly an unmet need. And so, for example, with talcutamab, we saw that the response rate overall was, say, 63% with prior T-cell redirection, but it was 70-plus percent with CAR-T, but only 40% with prior bispecific. So I think if you're going to go from a bispecific to bispecific, there may come with that some T-cell exhaustion that we need to think about. So that's one variable that we kind of just covered is duration. The dose and schedule need to be also addressed, as I think you're alluding to, keeping in mind that we got to these RP2D doses because they were the ones that seemed to correlate with the most activity and also likely based on translational like EC90, EC50, where they're using ex vivo models to kind of attempt to get at what we think is the right therapeutic dose. 
So I think we need to look at all of those things. But my guess is that I don't know that the dose and schedule will be enough because when we looked at our data set, for example, that infection paper, when you stop BCMA by specifics, the antibodies don't recover for many, many months. So if the whole goal of fixed duration therapy is to mitigate the infection risk, playing around with the dose and schedule may not be enough. It probably is going to be the duration is the primary variable to, that I think is going to impact infectious risk. I know this is a slightly different question. That was really interesting, but, but you make me wonder about in other fixed duration therapies like venetoclax and CLL or glofitimab in, in large cell lymphoma, there's a sort of question about possibility of retreatment. Do you think that that's something that would be on the cards in, in, in those bispecifics in myeloma that are being offered for fixed duration? I, yeah, I think certainly that's, it, that may be both not only infection saving, but cost saving, right? That why give everybody treatment to progression if you can actually give breaks. Historically in myeloma, we've always been able to take a break and retreat as long as the patient didn't progress on that, that same cocktail. Like sometimes I remember back in the day when we had only bortezomib and lenalidomide, when a patient was double refractory, you would combine them because what else did you have to do? Now we have a lot more choices, but I think there's every reason to think that you could retreat these patients. I think one of the questions though would be, we need to probably explore a little bit more about the priming and admission and CRS issues, right? How much gap can you safely take before you have to redo the whole priming again. And I would say in my clinical experience during COVID, which we were forced to learn this lesson, the vast majority of patients did not have recurrent CRS, but I can think of maybe one out of 40 patients who did have CRS again. Obviously, as these drugs get more into the community where there may be less experience, I think we have to think about the pros and cons of that, um, these approaches. Okay, now let's switch gears and talk about another bispecific antibody targeting GPRC5D, that is the talcitumab. Can you tell us what is GPR, GPRC5D receptor and which tissues is expressive? Sure. Um, so GPRC5D stands for G-protein coupled class 5 group D, and it's a seven transmembrane protein. We really don't honestly know a lot about its signaling mechanism or the receptor binding. Unlike BCMA, we do know it's not a shed peptide. So there's not as much of a soluble sink effect that can occur with BCMA directed therapies. So there is no soluble GPRC5D. What we know about is it's overexpressed in myeloma cells, particularly malignant plasma cells, more so than normal plasma cells, which may explain some of the lack of antibody production impairment with this target. <clears throat> but it comes with some non-heme, non-infectious toxicities, which is it's expressed on heavily keratinized tissue. So we see it's expressed in hair, but not throughout the hair cycle. So we have actually not seen a lot of alopecia at all, but hair is one, um, males, skin. And then the last one, which is unclear because the part of this, the challenge is how do you look at GPRC? Do you look at it by protein, mRNA, genomics, all of those? Um, and depending on which study you look at, some studies are showing potentially increased expression on salivary glands, which may be part of the taste the discusia issue that we see clinically. But I would say at a high level, it's uh, quite specific to malignant plasma cells. And, and the other thing is this heavily keratinized tissues. Now let's turn into the monumental one study that was recently published in New England Journal of Medicine and congratulations to you for being the first author in that publications. What were the dose limiting toxicities observed in this trial? Well, thank you. And it's really kudos to my entire team at Mount Sinai who accrued a lot of patients and there's a lot of work. The dose limiting toxicity primarily was just this one patient with rash as you know, the rashes in this drug are quite manageable, I think. Other than that, the other AEs were quite similar to what we typically see, and we can talk about those next, but the, mainly it was the DLT was the rash. Rash, okay. Now, given this is a phase one, phase two study, and we're talking about the toxicities, what are the rates of CRS and ICANS in the study? Yeah, so the CRS is, as with most products, in that like 60 to 70% range, typically grade one, grade two. We don't see a lot of high-grade CRS. <clears throat> I think the one population we sometimes see recurrent CRS is with heavy marrow burden, which is, I think, a emerging understanding. These patients may have unique challenges with bispecifics. ICANS is, tends to be around 10%. I think the reporting of the, the talcotomatic experience is quite interesting because it, it highlights some of the 
reporting issues with this because in the early part of the study, it was a different way of capturing the ICE score, mini mental status, and the reporting was different. And so we don't have that from part one, we only have it from the part two. So I think when we look at other bispecifics, whether or not they report icons is probably has to do more with reporting and data capture and not the drug. So I would, most of this icons is in the setting of fever and CRS. So it's kind of hard to separate out if somebody's ICE score is dropping, is it truly like some neurologic issue or is it, now I should mention there was some initial preclinical testing that suggested that GPRC is also expressed in part of the cerebellum. And so for that reason, the consent form recommended not driving for a month, but I personally have not seen any cerebral, cerebellar toxicity with this. And I think the bispecific GPRCs have been quite well tolerated from a neurologic perspective. And we already talked extensively about infection risks with BCMA bispecific antibodies. What about um, talcatamab? Yeah, so I think th when I was presenting this at ASH, they, there were three ways I think we can distinguish. So number one is the frequency of grade three, four infections. Instead of 30 to 40%, it's now 10 to 15% in very similar populations. So it's not like these are much less heavily treated, much less pentarefractory. So I would say grade three infections is less. Hypogamma is reported as 75% also, but the rates of IVIG support was only about 10% instead of 30 to 40% with BCMA directed. Third is COVID related deaths. There were two out of, I think, 275 or so in our ASH presentation. Whereas with teclistamab, which is the most mature, there was already 12 out of less than 200 patients. So, and, and as I alluded to the COVID antibody responses that we have internally. So I think grade three infections, use of IVIG, COVID related complications, are all things that seem to be different with talquetamab than with uh, other BCMA devices. It's because of the target of the drug or it's because of the drug itself? I think it's the target, right? Because, and again, the ideally the best way to answer that is a randomized study. Um, but sure. short of that, what's what argues that it's the target is Janssen has both products, right? Like. I, you know, I consider them like my children, I, like the two twins, Tech and Tau. They're both duo bodies. They both have the same silent FC portion. They both have one binding in CD3, one binding a target. So there's no closer way of doing a randomized study than basically having the company generate the same compound but changing up the target. And the fact that we're seeing profound hypogamma, profound vaccination abrogation with BCMA, but not with GPRC, to me would suggest that it's the target and not the construct. I think you already briefly mentioned about this, about the skin, nail, and the GI toxicities associated with this drug. Are these reversible or irreversible? Yeah, it's a really important question because I do think that we, and you know, we didn't pause about the, I, I mentioned, mentioned with the infection thing. We've been burned in myeloma three times <clears throat> with checkpoint inhibitors, with venetoclax and melflufin, where things look good with a single arm study. And then we understand the full impact in the randomized phase three. And I don't, I think if we don't play our cards correctly, we could have the same problem with these BCMA bispecifics because, you know, if we're losing a MRD negative stringent CR patient to, to an infectious complication, what else is there to do with that? Right. And so, and so in contrast to clistamab, uh, talquetamab, we've seen very little deaths during treatment and the OS is very, very encouraging signal. But it comes with these other toxicities, which undoubtedly are going to have an impact on quality of life. So I think you have to kind of pick the, compare the two, the infection versus these on target off tumor effects, right? That, that's what we're talking about with these different AEs. I think the number one thing I would say is they're related to dose. Because in fact, I remember with my nurses, we started the, I think it's crazy that these studies are, have been going on for so long. The first patient was dosed in 2017 and what I consider like these homeopathic doses. And I actually, we have a nurse who's still on this homeopathic dose four years out, which speaks to the potentially wide therapeutic index of these agents, right? Like what is the right dose and schedule? But it's, I bring that up because in the initial part of the phase one dose escalation, we didn't see these things. And we didn't see rashes, we didn't see nail changes, we didn't see dyscusia, and yet we saw responses, right? And so when it started happening with the first few patients, we're like, what is this? I guess it's not related because we hadn't seen it today, right? But it, I think there is a dose related issue with that. And so um, kudos again, I think doctors, we may be doing 
some of this stuff, but it's the nurses who are on the front line. And so they presented, our Sinai nursing team presented at ASH 2021, our experience with about 77 patients with talcretumab. And out of that, only one patient came off for non-PD. And I bring that up because these AEs, while significant and can, common, significant and impact quality of life, the good news is that they're responsive to dose intensity modulation. So I think the most troubling is the dyskusia, right? And so the main thing is we, the, because the responses are rapid and deep, you can just skip a dose and or dose it less frequently. And I think that that really mitigates that toxicity while we're underlying pathophysiology is being worked out. Because to really figure out how we're going to treat this AE, we need to understand the pathophysiology. And so what we've done so far <clears throat> is uh, artificial saliva, sal um, salivary substitutes, lozenges, <clears throat> hydrating solutions, but oral steroids have not been that successful. Uh, I think the main thing, what I tell patients is, listen, this is an active drug. This, and the consenting is an important part of this, right? Because if patients are going to tolerate much more, if they know what to expect, this is what will happen. If you get it, we can hold and skip doses because we'll know whether or not you're responding already. And then if you do, we'll skip it and then find the right dose and schedule for you long-term. And most patients, I think, take that well. And whereas infectious death, there's no coming back from that, right? So I think, um, and so that's the dyskusia, the other AEs. Rashes are quite easy to manage. They tend to happen early in the disease treatment, I would say cycle one. And that was typically managed with topical steroids and hydrating creams. And then also sometimes if it's a high grade rash, we give a short course of oral steroids. Um, the nails, we have tried different like hardening solutions. I, again, would direct this to my nurses who are much more uh, savvy with the, their nail management, but there's, I think there's a product called Renvella vitamin E oil. They've tried with varying successes. And I think, so those are the main AEs. One of the other things I would just highlight is because not only is there not as much infection, I think the cytopenia signal is also slightly different. I have a lot of BCMA patients who most, let's step back a second. Most cytopenias with all bispecifics happens in cycle one to two, because my, my hypothesis is that myeloma is a marrow-based disorder. The T cells are trafficking to the marrow and then releasing their cytokines. And then you have bystander effect. And that would explain why you don't see it as much in later cycles. But with BCMA, we have a sizable number of patients who have idiosyncratic neutropenia month three, month six, month nine. And uh, that's more tricky because they're already in an MRD negative stringent CR and yet you're going to give, you're trying to give growth factor to, so I think we don't tend to see that as much with talquetamab. And that again, may have to do with the dirtiness of the target. BCMA is expressed, yes, on myeloma, but probably a little bit more of a B cell lineage than maybe GPRC 5D is. And that may explain some of that. But I would say that's some of the major AE uh, issues with talquetamab. Um, and the IVIG, I don't give everybody IVIG with talquetamab. I only give it if they have met standard myeloma criteria in the past, which is recurrent bacterial infections more than three and four, three to four in a year with concurrent hypogamma. But most of these patients have already declared themselves. You didn't, you don't, if you didn't get to fifth line of therapy without already telling your doctor, are you an IVIG patient or not, right? It's not something that talcotamab suddenly unmasks. Whereas the BCMAs, everybody needs it. I wanted to ask with the uh, hair and, and nail and rash AEs, obviously the mechanism is different, but some allogeneic transplanters sort of have this feeling that if you get a little bit of chronic GVHD, that's kind of a good sign because you've got a bit of, you know, graft effect happening. As I said, it's a different mechanism, but do you see any kind of, do you sort of reassure yourself or your patients that if they're getting one of these kind of on target off tumor effects that, that you're more hopeful of a response or not really? Well, the good news is the response rate is 70%. So it's pretty hard to beat that, right? Like, and I think in this heavily treated population, the vast majority of patients are responding and they're responding quickly. And the ones that don't are the same typical people, which is ISS3, extramedullary, and um, probably prior T cell redirection therapies, right? So I think in those three subgroups, I'm going to be paying a little bit more attention. And honestly, for those patients, I try to put them, there's a lot of, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about it more, but like, a lot of really exciting combination strategies because we, up till now we've just been talking about monotherapy, but clear um, combinations are really the way to go forward. But given, but we need to pay attention to the AE profiles here. And that's where I think GPRC can really stand out because it's hard to combine something when there's a background high infectious death rate and neutropenia rate, right? Whereas if the AEs are very unique to this drug, like 
no other myeloma drugs cause this dyskusia, nail changes, and rashes are pretty transient anyway. So I think the AE profile is not just important to characterize for basic bedside management, but has really significant ramifications for combination strategies going forward. So before we move on from GPRC 5D, just we talked a lot about toxicity, uh, but just a quick note on like, uh, you know, what do you, what do you think is the ballpark overall response rate, CR rate and the PFS with, with talcoetamab? And how does that compare with teclistamab and other BCMA bispecifics? So the response rate across the board around 70%. I think the PFS, the follow-up is not as long, but depending, there were two doses studied and that was presented at ASH, 400 micrograms weekly or 800 every two weeks. There was a slight difference, and I don't know if that's due to follow-up, and we'll need more data, but it was about seven and a half months for the weekly 400 and about 11 plus months for the 800 every two weeks. And then I think the DOR, the follow-up is still short. CR rates are probably in that 10 to 20% range again. So I think, you know, very active drugs, hard to compare across the, with any more granularity than that because of the usual caveats. Yeah, in the interest of time, since you're almost coming up to an hour, I wanted to ask some practically relevant questions that we are facing in the clinic and just to pick your brain, given uh, you have so much experience in Mount Sinai with these drugs. So the first is, let's imagine a clinical scenario where a patient with pentarefractory myeloma received standard of care Silta cell, was in a MRD negative stringency around day 100, but now relapsing at six months with extra medullary relapse, which, you know, we have, have all seen some of these patients. Assuming the patient doesn't have access to a trial, will you be comfortable using teclistamab in this setting? And is, is there any data of using BCMA bispecifics after relapse from CAR-T, BCMA CAR-T? There was an updated ASH about tech post CAR-T and the response rate was 50 something percent, but what we don't have is the PFS. And I think that's gonna be really important because my guess is that's gonna be compromised. And the only other thing is I would just be wary of the, because CAR-T has flu psi, which can ablate your immune system for up to six months, to come in right after that with another drug that also causes hypogamma. Because usually we've seen it takes about six months to recover your immune system. And then you come in right after that with another BCMA. I would personally like to switch targets. And then, not that you couldn't use teclistamab later, but why not? switch to a different target if you have access to it, and then go back to tech in the future when there's a bit of a, a gap. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Yeah, if there is, a, for example, a trial of talcoetamab, you would prefer that over giving standard of care teclistamab in this patient. Is there a data whether the bispecific antibodies, they cross blood-brain barrier, given, you know, we have almost no good drug for CNS myeloma, like, is there any data of bispecifics crossing blood-brain barrier or anecdotal responses in CNS myeloma? Short answer is no, all such patients are excluded from studies. Longer answers, I think when you have CNS myeloma, there is already some intrinsic blood brain barrier disruption from the disease process. So there may be some penetration, but if we use DARA as an example of a full sized antibody in studies that have been done to date, the amount of DARA that gets to the CSF is quite low compared to systemic penetration. Sounds good. As you know, we often face this, if we are taking a patient to CAR-T, we try to avoid things like bendamustine, for example, you know, because they are T-cell toxic. Given bispecific antibodies, they also utilize the endogenous T-cells. Do you think we should try to avoid bendamustine or drugs like bendamustine or fludarabine immediately before, as a prior line of therapy immediately before a bispecific as well? My guess is probably yes. And I think probably the two most important things coming out of ASH 2022 were sequencing data and the tech correlative paper, which is Cortez Silva. And what they showed is that when they looked at all the teclistamab study from the New England data set, the number one feature of poor response was impaired T cell fitness, whether it's expression of PD-1, lag, TIGIT, all of those things. And it also correlated with higher burden. Patients with higher marrow burden had worse T cell fitness. So I think my guess is in the future, we're gonna have some limited T-cell profiling that will guide what we do. It doesn't have to be this full fancy panel, but what is your absolute lymphocyte count and how impaired are your T-cells or not? And that would then guide what you would do next. Um, but I think, uh, because I've seen a hand, even though we said response rates are 70%, I've had a handful of patients just go from one study to another to another without any meaningful response. And I think those are probably the impaired T-cell fitness that we, we may need to do a non-T-cell dependent mechanisms such as a cell mod or an ADC interspersed between T-cells.
All right. One final question. If there was a, although it's not happening, but if there was a head to head, let's say randomized control trial of BCMA bispecific antibody versus a BCMA car in, in pentarefractory myeloma right now, you know, which one do you think would win? <laughs> well, I have my slide that I show usually, which is the Rolls Royce versus the Toyota Corollas. And it's not about the cost because if you're buying a Corolla every month for a year, it's the same cost, right? But um, the point is that it's much easier to get a Toyota Corolla. And in, in the global economy, it, the access to car T's will be few and far between. And also, I think the typical patient, you cannot have a rapidly explosive patient go to car T. Up till now, car T's had tremendous patient selection. It's had bridging chemo, which will impact the PFS, which no other myeloma study has done. And then there's a supportive care needed after car T. So my guess, I always say, is that if your PFS on a car T is less than a year, so much of that is patient selection and bridging chemo. And I would put money much more on a bispecific. However, if your PFS is over two years, this is the best product that we've had to date. And the quality of life should not be minimized, right? To untether a patient from the cancer center for over two years is incredible. And so I think the devil's in the details. It's what is the PFS of a purported BCMA CAR T? And, and then that would be when you then factor access and patient selection you'll get a pretty clear answer from a hypothetical randomized study. All right. Thank you, Dr. Chari, for your time. And I think this was great. And we covered the bispecific antibodies in details, and I'm sure our audience will love it. We'll have you back for sure in the future, talk about other topics on myeloma. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you.